Yes. Uh, no, uh, Dr. Ghassan's uh, link is showing invalid. Can you resend the link to him? Sure. Done. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, we will wait a couple of minutes until we get everyone in, in the webinar, okay? Thank you all for coming. Okay, let me start. Um, a very warm welcome to our uh, prenatal exciting webinar. My name is Noor and it is a huge honor for us to uh, host this webinar. A huge congratulations for getting this far. I hope you are enjoying your pregnancy journey and uh, Ramadan Kareem to all of you. We really hope that today we'll provide you with as much information as possible from our expert speakers, and we cannot wait to oh, announce the winners for today. Okay, uh, just to give you a quick idea of how things are going to run, we will be hearing from our leading experts throughout the webinar. Feel free to ask as many questions throughout the webinar, uh, like on the Q&A uh, icon on the bottom of your screen. If you would like to be part of this webinar chat, please ensure your screen uh, that it's not on full screen mode to see the question and answers. Um, and you choose all panelists and attendees option in the chat. Uh, we would also like to ask you to please mute yourself on Zoom so you will be able to hear us better. Uh, we will be having amazing prices uh, in the end of the webinar and nice discounts and we will talk about it in the end. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Bhawana, our, uh, the marketing manager in uh, Fakih University Hospital. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you, No, no worries. Thank you everybody for joining in. I will take uh, brief minutes to introduce you to Fakir University Hospital. We have commissioned uh, in the UAE as uh, one of the largest investments in healthcare in UAE of US dollar 500 million. And it is, uh, it is a new hospital, but the healthcare legacy comes from Fakir Care Group, which is a 43 year old uh, healthcare group back in Saudi Arabia. And we have various verticals of home care, uh, um, we, uh, academic universities. And as I say, Faki University Hospital, it's a hospital which will have a medical university attached to it. So we have experts here who train doctors to become the doctors of the future and uh, of the near future. So you will find the most experienced uh, clinical professors and the doctors at Faki University Hospital. Uh, the hospital is equipped to manage 700,000 patients a year, and uh, it is built over a space area of 1 million square feet. Uh, again, one of the firsts in UAE. We have uh, a very huge, uh, Women's Health Department, which is led by uh, Dr. Hassan, who's here, who will speak about the department as well. And uh, we, uh, something which we, uh, which we take pride in is that we have our unique birthing units. And uh, these birthing units include uh, your water birthing, your baby management, your labor facility, everything in the same room and with a lot of comfort than you will find anywhere else. Uh, Jana, my midwife and nurse manager over here, she would uh, introduce you to more details about this. Without taking much time, I would hand it back to Noor and then we can start with the topics. Yeah, thank you everyone again for joining in. Thank you, Bhavana. 
Uh, okay. Uh, so let's start with uh, Dr. Ghassan. Dr. Ghassan is a Swedish Finnish of Lebanese origin. After finishing his thesis on hormonal re receptors in uterine cancer in 1989 in St. Petersburg, he moved to Finland and, this, and then Sweden when he finished his fellowship on obstetrics and gynecology after working for 21 years in the university hospitals of Soder and uh, Karolinska in Stockholm. Um, uh, Ulefa University Hospital in Oslo and he heading Obigaini Department in Finland. Dr. Lutfi moved with his family to Dubai in, in 2010, where he worked in private hospitals as well, DHA Latifa hospitals. He helped build centers of excellence in minimally in invasive gynecologic surgery and promoted care uh, for endometriosis triosis pa uh, pa patients in the UAE and the region. Uh, Dr. Rotfi founded the Emirates in Endometriosis League and he helped with the several MIGS, MIGS centers by the excellence of uh, SRCAGL. So we would like to welcome Dr. Rassan Lutfi, HOCD and consultant obstetricians and the gynecologist in Fakih University Hospital. Very warm welcome, Dr. Rassan. Thank you, thank you, Noor, and uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity um, to speak with uh, uh, with an audience that is uh, uh, more uh, the, towards the the, the kind of uh, clients and people that we meet with every day. Yes. Uh, I think this is a valuable, a more valuable opportunity uh, to speak on a, a frank and. Uh, uh, a leveled basis than to speak in scientific uh, conferences because this is the kind of information that we would like to carry directly to the mothers and to the female population. So as was presented uh, by Bawana and by uh, Noor, uh, Fakih University Hospital is a startup uh, uh, tertiary center project. And um, after working in governmental and private hospitals uh, in, in the UAE, and uh, as also uh, Noor mentioned, I, uh, working in Scandinavia, uh, I find this um, facility a promising project of uh, uh, bringing uh, healthcare to the patient instead of uh, asking the patient to come to healthcare. Uh, it's not a sophisticated uh, concept, but it's challenging. And I think uh, it needs a lot of coordination between different um, healthcare providers. And of course, uh, to keep a direct communication with the population and with uh, the female population in order to have the message uh, that we want to deliver about uh, standardized Thank you. Yeah. COVID and uh, COVID infection and the pregnancy. It's, uh, I think uh, if we go back. Uh, a series of epidemics. Followed directly by a SARS. Epidemic that we know about is the swine flu. And latest was also the Zika. That was of the effect of this Zika virus on pregnancies. And
Doctor, your voice is not audible. Yeah, we still break. Can't hear. No. Can't hear, doctor. Uh, can you remove the headphones and try? Uh, not is it connected to Bluetooth, the headphones? Just, yeah. Malformations that occurs among stars okay. um, COVID infection one year ago, uh, experiencing one of the most devastating and 100 million people. And, up and um, so do you hear? Uh, is it breaking you? And let me let me know if it's still breaking. Right. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, the headphones. So I'm I'm speaking. Uh, it's working. It's working better. So the, do you hear me now? Don't we? Is it working? Do you hear me? Yes. You hear me. All right. So uh, I hope that what I mentioned regarding the COVID epidemic has been carried on. But as I mentioned. Uh, according to the WHO uh, statistics, we have around 100 mil million uh, affected people by the COVID infection, and uh, by up to date, 2.4 to 2.5 million fatalities. Now, what makes uh, this infection uh, particularly dramatic uh, is the way of spreading of the symptoms that is mainly either asymptomatic or what we call pre-symptomatic in almost 50% of cases. So mainly people who get sick with COVID will not show symptoms directly. And that makes it a silent disease that carries the infection very quickly uh, through the aerosol or through respiratory tract uh, to uh, the surroundings. And um, it is well known that um, uh, pregnant women uh, uh, that are symptomatic with COVID uh, are at very high risk for risk of admission to hospital, uh, getting uh, ventilated and uh, uh, suffering from oxygen saturation due to the affection that happens to the upper respiratory tract. Now, uh, it has been quite long debated about the effect of the COVID on the pregnancy and on the, um, on the baby and uh, in utero during the pregnancy. And due to the lack of the uh, scientific research uh, concerning uh, the pregnancy population, the main focus has been targeted about, uh, towards isolating the epidemic and creating a vaccination. Hence, uh, all the data that has been accumulated has been mainly uh, or random reports coming from different facilities, from different countries, up to case reports. Uh, we know that um, the symptoms that occur to pregnant women are pretty much the same symptoms that occur to non-pregnant people, which include the upper respiratory tract, fever, uh, the general illness and mainly the uh, loss of oxygen saturation. The other um, a very characteristic feature of the COVID infection during the pregnancy is the long incubation period. And the incubation period means is the time from um, the affection when the patient, when the pregnant woman uh, contracts the virus and until the first symptoms happen. And this is described to be anything between five to 14 days. And that's why uh, the, the major complications that has been happening is because people has been delayed in either getting attention to their symptoms and uh, 
uh, admitted to the hospital or visiting physicians at a later stage when the viral infection has taken its course. Now, the interesting part, which I wanted to probably mention and speak about today, that besides knowing or uh, acknowledging that pregnancy in itself is now considered to be a risk factor for the epidemic, and I will mention that uh, in a little while uh, with relation to the immune system of the pregnant woman, the good news that has been coming now recently and with new publications um, in, in the literature and which has been acknowledged by the CDC, which is the Center of Disease Control in the United States, that uh, the certain types of the COVID vaccination has been considered to be safe and uh, to be encouraged uh, to give uh, for pregnant women. Now, these vaccinations are mainly the one that uh, follow the technique of the M uh, RNA messenger. So we're talking about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccination. And uh, according to these publications, which has um, uh, uh, accumulated around 35,000 pregnant women who received the vaccination either at the uh, onset of the pregnancy or during the pregnancy, that besides the, the similar side effects uh, that happens to non-pregnant population, and mainly pain in the site of the injection, mild fever, uh, dizziness, uh, nausea, and so on, the vaccine has been proven to be safe in this category of patients. So this is a promising landmark to continue research and studies amongst the uh, pregnant population regarding uh, the implementation of the vaccine uh, in the future in the pregnant population. Now, there is a note um, that has to be shared uh, that uh, this vaccination has not been studied um, sufficiently, uh, mainly at the start of the pregnancy. So we know that uh, most of the vac vaccinated population has been in the late pregnancies, but we still don't have assuring um, data about the effect or the possible effect of the vaccination in the very early uh, or the first trimester of the pregnancy when the baby or the embryo is just uh, being uh, developed. So uh, that's reassuring and that brings us to the, to the time where uh, a pregnant woman has to uh, consider that uh, when pregnant, the immune system uh, in such a condition as the COVID uh, epidemic, like in many other viral infections, is the major, um, uh, let's say, uh, milestone or the, the, the major pillar in protecting the, the mother and the baby from the infection. So talking about the immune system, uh, I just wanted I want to, to uh, generalize about a concept that in the past we used to consider that the uh, immune system in pregnant women used to be weakened in order to allow the pregnancy as a foreign body to uh, enhance and to progress. But now we know that um, this is not uh, quite true and that the immune system in a pregnant woman acts in an aggressive way uh, to facilitate certain immunological responses in different stages of the pregnancy, meaning that the body of the mother accommodates to the pregnancy with a natural response of the immune system, which includes the T cell function and other immunomodulators, which allows the, the pregnancy and the progress of the baby to happen within the uh, formulation of the organs and the systems of the mother. That sometimes can be with a positive effect, that is when the uh, placental blood, uh, blood circulation integrates with the mother's blood circulation, but it can sometimes weaken the, the immune response of the mother under certain circumstances. So, so just to bring it to the uh, main points that I wanted to uh, 
uh, also mention uh, about uh, how to enhance uh, the uh, how to boost the the immune system during the pregnancy uh, we just need to put it in a nutshell that the immune system during pregnancy is a fine-tuned balance between um, exercise and activity and um, healthy well-being and between uh, passive rest. So there has to be this balance where a woman needs to listen to her body while enhancing her physical and physiological uh, potentials to cope with the pregnancy. So basically, as we know, it starts with healthy food and hydration. I'm not going to go into details because I'm sure that you will find a lot of literature, a lot of information on the, on the net about what is healthy food. Uh, it's mainly that a woman needs to balance the diet in a way to feel saturated while at the same time to have the need to get the nutrition in divided portions that will allow her to uh, maintain a healthy diet while at the same time to feel well. Hydration on the other hand, and especially now in the holy month of Ramadan, is extremely important. It doesn't mean that fasting is contraindicated during pregnancy, but it does necessarily mean that once there are symptoms of headache, uh, dizziness, fatigue, pain in the pelvic area, then it is not healthy to continue fasting, mainly because of the de dehydration that can occur with the fasting process. So uh, it, is, it is extremely important for the woman to be uh, very objective about the signs that might come up during fasting. Now it brings me to the second point, which is probably the most important point in the relationship between the immune system and the COVID infection or the COVID epidemic, and uh, that is personal hygiene. As so far and until now, and beside vaccination, specifically uh, personal hygiene, uh, hand uh, washing, sanitization, uh, keeping distancing, social distancing, and so forth, is still considered to be the front line of defense for any, uh, uh, any uh, person, uh, not the least a pregnant woman, uh, in the defense against the uh, COVID epidemic. So it's extremely important to avoid uh, big gatherings. It's extremely important and uh, more even to avoid sick people or people with symptoms and to maintain the, the hand hygiene, which will give protection not only uh, against the COVID, but against a series of infections and uh, other uh, uh, flu or viral infections that might uh, affect the pregnancy. Uh, so along with that, of course, we have certain list of supplements that uh, we can focus on and mainly vitamin D iron and zinc. So vitamin D the, uh, has been shown in, in a lot of publications that having a dose of one to 2,000 a day or a 10,000 weekly uh, would be sufficient and necessary to maintain a, a good immune system response. Iron is necessary when needed because anemia uh, will, by definition, uh, uh, impact and if affect the immune system, and uh, it will not allow the woman to be uh, in a healthy response to anything, whether it is to stress or to physiological or pathological uh, agents. And uh, amongst with that, and if possible, zinc 40 milligram a day or together with the general supplements will be also uh, advised. Now, bringing to the other part of the, uh, the things that a pregnant woman would do, uh, as much as activities is extremely important during pregnancy, and I'm talking about 20 minutes a day, and this activity can be swimming, which is highly recommended because swimming will give the balance between the blood circulation and the muscle tonus together with the breathing exercise, yoga to whoever is able to do um, uh, uh, to do uh, this uh, physical exercise, 
Uh, and this can be done in one to two days and separate uh, sessions. Together with that, it's extremely important to have enough sleep periods. So a pregnant woman should have at least seven to nine hours of sleep to allow her body to recap the stress that goes together with the, with the daily uh, requirements, whether the pregnant woman is a working woman or if she's a, 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 a household uh, uh, responsible for the family and her children. Uh, so this balance is extremely important. It shouldn't be that uh, a pregnant woman should be idle. At the, on the other hand, excessive exercise without having enough sleep will also break down the immune system. Of course, the last point, which is the vaccination, and that is uh, important because um, uh, together with talking about the COVID vaccination, which is still in the early stages, of confirming whether this is going to be the future for uh, a healthy pregnancy. The flu vaccine is one of the seasonal flu, I mean, is one of the recommended um, uh, vaccinations that should be given. Why is that? It's mainly because until now, there is no segregation or cre clear discrepancy between uh, the, the usual flu, the seasonal flu, and the COVID. So the tests that are usually provided might sometimes mix the, the flu with the COVID, which might create also a confusion about the, the seriousness of the disease and more important about the kind of immunity that a woman, pregnant woman might develop after contracting a viral infection. Hence, and when it is time for the seasonal flu vaccination, which is usually from September onward, it is, uh, very important to probably uh, address this issue and discuss it with your, um, uh, with your uh, physician to understand the benefits and to see how that would help in the time of the pandemic. The last word is that the last word isn't said yet for the uh, COVID epidemic. It seems that we are going through different spikes of this epidemic from the first to the second expected spike. Now we're going through the third, and now we're speaking about a fourth spike. And the main reason might be uh, the mutations that of the virus that are taking place in different geographical areas, different countries carried on from one country to another. Hence, um, country like Finland, which has had uh, uh, the best record of uh, near no fatalities and low number of, of infections has suddenly um, changed course recently into another lockdown because uh, uh, having acquired in its population a new mutated virus. So the, the picture hasn't been drawn completely regarding the, the COVID epidemic and vigilance and um, uh, uh, health promotion is a very important issue amongst pregnant women as well as non-pregnant in the present days. So uh, the last thing that I wanted to say is that the new publications also that were uh, given through the WHO and the international uh, medical societies is that during the epidemic, a pregnant woman has been affected very uh, widely and uh, it is probably more in the less developed countries uh, with uh, uh, higher numbers of stillbirth and um, uh, serious admissions to, to ICU amongst pregnant women. And the reason which is given is uh, because uh, the, the, the disconnection between the regular health care that is usually provided for pregnant women because of the lockdowns, because of the distancing, because of the uh, fear of visiting hospitals and medical centers and so on. And uh, when these resources are absent, when, when a pregnant woman is not able to go and visit her physician, visit the clinic in the regular basis, then of course we can expect a higher rate of morbidities and um, uh, uh, negative outcomes, whether for the pregnancy and for the baby. So uh, telemedicine is one of the answers, but of course uh, in, in countries like the UAE, uh, 
where the vaccination rollout has been very efficient and where the numbers have been going down, it's only natural and it's only uh, wise to try to find the balance between uh, good uh, screening, a good uh, and continuous follow-up for your pregnancy, as well as self-protection from the surrounding and keeping yourself and your uh, dear ones in, in safe uh, environment. So I, I want to close on this positive note, and I hope that uh, the information given in a, in a uh, summary would help to bring out some discussion and uh, some assets. And I thank uh, Self Save Arabia and Noor also for the opportunity to get this webinar and this uh, uh, promotional uh, event uh, that we hope will continue in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ghassan. It was a really nice topic. Um, and we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, so we have, uh, my wife took first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine and then she become pregnant. 10 weeks now, she canceled the second dose of vaccine. Any pregnancy risk due to the first vaccine taken? Uh, well, uh, of course, I <laughs> AstraZeneca has been uh, scrutinized in a very, in many ways because of the, uh, I mean, uh, because of some reports about side effects, but it is safe that uh, to say that one shot of AstraZeneca would be enough to give a first immune response to, uh, to the recipient. And uh, I would assume, and I would suggest that there is no need to worry about having the first shot uh, so close to the time of the conception. And at the same time, I would think that um, uh, having this vaccination at, the, at, the, at the first shot would be enough to create a certain immune response uh, that will help the lady, the pregnant lady to uh, be safe for the coming period of time. So I wouldn't suggest necessarily to take another vaccine, another shot. And I would think that that uh, first uh, dose was safe to be taken and it shouldn't be an issue for the pregnancy. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, it's my third trimester and I live in UAE. Is it safe for me to take COVID vaccine? If yes, then which vaccine should I take? Right, so again, uh, this is a discussion. So according to the, like I mentioned, according to the CDC and the American College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the, the vaccine should not be withheld from the pregnant population if they wish to. So uh, in such a case, the benefits and the risks should be discussed with the physician. In such meaning, a pregnant woman who has no risk factors, uh, no obesity, no hypertension, no risk factors in the family or for herself, like vein thrombosis or anything similar, should discuss probably with her physician whether it is wise to take the vaccine at this point in the third trimester when the pregnancy is coming to an end. If there is, on the contrary, any kind of a risk factor that can, uh, in case an infection happens, uh, uh, worsen the infection, then probably the vaccine would be advised in such a case. So. Uh, the vaccines, as I mentioned, that are recommended so far that has been studied are the Pfizer and the Moderna. So the case should be discussed with the physician to weigh out the risk factors and to judge whether at this point there is benefit more than the risk to take the vaccine. Okay. Um, there is one. I completed my second dose of Sinopharm on 23rd January. I am 12 weeks pregnant. Is it okay or there, is, there will be any risks? Uh, in January and now 12 weeks pregnant. 12, so, yeah. yeah, so basically it was at the onset of the pregnancy. As I mentioned in the studies that were published in the uh, journal, uh, England, uh, England Journal of Medicine, there, there is no sufficient data uh, about the, the effect of the vaccine uh, in general, the COVID vaccine in the early pregnancy. But uh, the, the vaccinations that has been given and the, that has been studied, as I mentioned again, it was Moderna and Pfizer, has not found any, um, uh, any side effects or even 
uh, adverse reactions, whether with the mother or with the newborn. So the, 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 the babies that were born to this population of 35,000 or more pregnant women has shown that there is a certain and good positive uh, antibody response in the newborn after the mothers have taken the, the, the vaccination. But uh, this, is, this cannot be generalized, of course, and this is a preliminary data. So what I can say that for the time being, there is not enough data to uh, say how these vaccines can work in the start of the, um, let's say, early embryo embryological stages of the pregnancy. And what would be wise is just to follow with uh, ultrasound uh, uh, examinations, and especially at 12 weeks like, like now, and uh, later on between 19 and 22 weeks. So these are the two state, the phases of the pregnancy when an ultrasound would help to make sure that everything is fine with the baby. Okay. Uh, we still have two questions, but it's different than COVID. Uh, when I became pregnant, I was overweight 75 kg and I'm borderline diabetic. Hence, my diet is very limited and I'm confused. What shall I eat to keep all proteins and vitamins I need without increasing the weight and blood pressure and blood uh, sugar? Yes, this is this is a very common dilemma with, uh, of course, I mean, there is no there is no formula for this. Uh, because we, we deal with, with the uh, changes of weight uh, together with the age and the, the background of the, let's say, hormonal background, uh, whether there is or not polycystic ovarian syndrome, insulin resistance, uh, the, 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 the heritage, whether there are genetic uh, predisposal factors. So this is... Uh, it's, it's not, there is no straight uh, answer to the question. What I might say is that uh, after completing certain studies at certain age, uh, then the only way is to balance the, 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 the um, uh, input and the output of the, of the energy. So that's, that's the direct uh, formulation. But of course, for people who do have tendency or do have pathological issues with insulin resistance, carbohydrate uh, uh, metabolism and so on, that's much more complex. So it, needed, it needs to be addressed in a more kind of uh, individual pattern. Okay. Okay, let's take the last question. If I took AstraZeneca as first dose, can I change into another brand of that vaccine? Uh, this is a common question in the communities where there has been deficiencies in the distribution of the vaccination or shortage. So uh, it has been discussed whether, uh, for example, one vaccine can replace or can complement the other vaccine. There is no studies on that. And uh, this is not considered to be a standard practice, both because of the type of side effects that can happen, as well as the nature of the uh, vaccine and uh, the, the uh, anticipated response. So uh, it, it is not recommended because simply it will not justify or it will not, uh, let's say, um, bulletproof uh, the level of antibodies and the immune, immune response later on. So if there is a possibility to wait and to get the second shot of the same vaccine, even if that would take longer time than three weeks or four weeks or even six weeks, it is much more wise to do that so as to get to the uh, saturated level or the highest level possible of, uh, of immunity for, uh, after such vaccination. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor. It was sure. a pleasure okay, having yeah. you. Um, of course, everyone can reach Dr. Ghassan in Fakih University Hospital. Um, so next, we would like to welcome Jana Krit. Uh, she's a midwife nurse manager in women's health in uh, Fakih University Hospital. Um, and she will be talking about the myths and science of pain relief during labor. Let's welcome Jenna. Thank you, Nir. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, I will share my screen now just to uh, share the presentation that I've prepared for everybody. Yes, sure. Please let me know if, um, if there's any problems with the audio.
Yes, we can, can see. You. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jana. I am the nurse manager um, in Kaki University Hospital for Women's Health. Um, and part of what we do here is, is um, trying to educate people and making sure that people have enough un uh, understanding and uh, enough information to make informed choices during labor and during the birth process. And part of this today, we're going to talk about the myths and the sciences of pain relief during labor, which is something that um, a lot of people worry about, the pain during labor. And there's a lot of things that's going around um, that you either heard from family, that you either heard from um, on the internet somewhere, that is not necessarily a reflection of what is actually happening. So if we look at what the myth is, it is a wildly held but a very false belief or idea that was created in order to explain something that is unknown. Now, I think you can all see the picture here. This is a stalk with a little bag there that is supposedly a baby. And I think most of us have seen this uh, picture somewhere and was told when we were growing up, this is how babies are delivered, um, which we obviously know now. It's not that um, it doesn't happen that way. But um, a lot of times we have um, people telling us things um, related to pain relief and related to pregnancy, and we're not always sure what it is. So let's just look at a few myths that is commonly um, going around and that people tell you. Um, one of them would be is that you will need the most powerful drugs to get through labor. Uh, you can only choose one pain management option for your labor, which is not true. Uh, you can't have an epidural early in labor and you need pain in order to deliver. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, so what we know is, and what is a fact is, is that every woman experiences pain in a different way. So how she will respond to this pain and how she will deal with this pain during pain, uh, labor and uh, childbirth is different. So no one person is this experience, will experience labor in the same way. That's why you cannot say that what works for me will work for you. Um, it is a different experience for everybody. The other fact that we know is, is that, and what we, what we definitely believe is that the decision on what method you use to manage your pain during labor is an individual choice. This is something that only you can decide, you and your husband. This is not something that I as a healthcare provider can decide for you, I can advise you, I can give you the options, but the choice should be yours. And um, a lot of times people around us, our families, our friends, actually want to make sure that, or will offer us their opinions, okay? But the choice to what you use during labor is actually just yours and your husband. Um, and then what you also need to remember is that every childhood is a unique experience. Um, and if this is your first pregnancy or this is your third pregnancy, every time you will go through pregnancy and you will go through labor, it is going to be different from before. And therefore, you might use different ways of dealing with your pain during the, the labor in consecutive pregnancy. So what we need to do and what you need to do and you and your husband need to talk about this is that you sit and discuss what is the best technique for coping with your labor pain, with your birth process, um, or combination, and what works for you, all right? This is not something that, um, again, like I said, as health providers, we can decide, we can guide you. Um, and a good idea is to do is to sit together and look at what you want from labor. It can be from um, start to finish, from what to happen pain medication you want or pain methods you want to use, um, what, what you want to do in, during delivery, what you want to do after the delivery. But it's good to sit and talk these things out and have a birth plan so that when you come to um, where you're going to deliver, that you can discuss this with the people that is um, taking care of you that day, discuss this with your, your doctor, with the midwife attending you, the nurse that is attending you. Um, but it's good to just understand and make sure that everybody's aware of what you want. 
Now, part of having pain is a physical experience. It is um, the way the body um, goes into labor, the way the baby moves to the birth canal, the way the baby is delivering, delivered. But there's different things that can influence our experience of pain. And then we talk about this fear, tension, pain cycle. Um, there's been some, some studies done on this, and this is kind of accepted to uh, influence your pain um, and your experience of labor a lot. So fear is something that we are experiencing when we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and for most people, when it's your first pregnancy, you're worried about what's going to happen. You don't understand. You don't necessarily have all the information. Um, so the fear of the unknown is something that is very relevant during pregnancy. If you've had uh, children before, you've had deliveries before, that fear of what is going to happen can also be um, affecting your experience of, of your labor and of, what your, uh, of your pain. Um, so if you experience this fear, it can lead to a lot of tension and anxiety in your body. And we know that a lot of time, the tension um, and the anxiety that you feel can affect also your experience of pain because if you're more tense and you're more um, anxious, your experience of pain is going to be increased and you're not going to have um, the ability to deal with it in a, in a way that is good for you. Um, and then obviously you have your pain um, and your physical pain, which is based on where you're going to labor, the contractions you feel, the way the baby moves to the birth canal, the actual birth. Um, and if we break, we take any one of these items out of this cycle, this fear, uh, fear tension, pain cycle, then we can uh, influence our experience of pain. So if we remove some of the fear that you have um, for labor, for pregnancy, for delivery, for what's happening after delivery, then we re reduce the tension that we feel, and therefore we can influence the, the level of pain and we can uh, um, uh, uh, make sure that the pain is easier to deal with. If we remove the fear, then we remove the tension, then we can reduce the pain that we experience. Um, so if we look at how to reduce the fear, then basically most of the time how we reduce the fear is through education. Um, we are educating people about what to expect. We are educating people on um, what methods of pain relief there is, like we're doing today. We are educating people about breastfeeding, about labor options, um, what to expect after birth. So those are all things that is going to help you um, become more uh, empowered and be able to make more informed choices. So therefore you reduce the risk of fear um, uh, or reduce the fear of, of, of pain and reduce the fear of pregnancy and labor. What we can do to remove that tension part for this from the cycle is to use different methods of pain relief. So tension mainly to relieve that anxiety, to relieve that stress and, and uh, tension you have in your body, um, you can use different natural and non-medical methods of pain relief. And we've discussed this just now. And if you want to actively uh, manage the um, the physical pain that you experience during labor, the, the contractions, the progress of the birth canal, the actual delivery, then we look at more medical um, methods of pain relief. Um, this is a picture of our, one of our birthing suites, which we're very proud of. Um, and we've got eight rooms like this that has got a birthing pool in. And uh, what we want to experience, want to try and, and uh, allow people or to promote here is a more natural birth or to do what you need to do, whichever way you want to deliver and whichever way you want to deal with your um, labor pains, we want to promote this. And just to give you a brief overview of more natural and non-medical um, methods of pain relief, um, there's so many options. Uh, it is all related to relaxation to be mobile. So you've got um, things like meditation, yoga, mindfulness, you've got breathing, you've got um, more active labor where you are actively choosing which position you want to labor in, you want to choose which position you want to deliver in, there's more freedom of movement, um, 
you get more empowered to make your own choices. We've got, um, there's birthing pools, there's water, um, a warm water in the showers, um, there's heat that you can use. It's all more natural and non-medical methods of pain relief. Uh, touch and massage plays a big role uh, because you do uh, make, uh, reduce the muscle tension by, by either light or counter pressure massage. Um, you can use things like TENS machine, which is a small little uh, machine that you have electrodes stuck to the area where you have pain. It blocks the pain uh, sensors that's going to your brain. And it's very beneficial during early labor. And some people even use it throughout the active labor until delivery. And then I think a lot of people has heard about hypnobirthing, which is something that is um, working very much on um, creating a relaxed state between mind and body. Uh, and it, you get, it's a course that you do with your husband. Um, somebody needs to be qualified to train, to, to teach this. And it is all about self-hypnosis techniques, various, like, various relaxations. And most of these natural and non-medical methods have now shown that if you do it right and you focus very well, you can have a shorter labor with less interventions. Um, and also, patients have a better experience of their labor. Now, I've said before that uh, it is right in the beginning is that it's your choice which method of pain relief that you use. So if you choose to use this um, more natural and uh, non-medical method of pain relief during labor, then that is your choice and we are going to support you and everybody should support you wherever you choose to deliver. Um, but there's some people that prefer to have a more medical um, method in, uh, of pain relief during labor and that is perfectly fine. Like we said, whatever you want to uh, use during labor, is, it should be your choice and nobody can take that away from you and we can only give advice as healthcare providers. So the different um, me methods of, med uh, medical methods of pain relief, sorry, is uh, uh, internox gas, which is nitrous oxide and oxygen gas. Um, it is a fairly quick, uh, quick working method. It is something that will reduce your pain to a level that you can cope with it better. It will not take away the pain completely, but it doesn't have any lasting effects. So it works very quickly. Betadine is a narcotic. It's an injection we give in your muscle. Okay, It normally takes about 20 to 30 minutes to work. But again, like with the Internox, it does not completely take away your pain. It does... So um, help you relax more so that you can, again, cope better with, with what, um, uh, what is happening with your body. Um, epidural is the last type of medical method of uh, pain relief that we do have. It is a continuous infusion. It's a little uh, plastic cannula that's inserted in your back. Uh, we give medications uh, throughout the labor with, uh, the, through this little cannula. Um, and this is one of the methods that a lot of people choose because it actually can block the pain um, between 90 to 95% of the time. Uh, and a lot of people prefer this. And whatever choice you make, make sure that you understand what is the risk factors, what is the benefits of it, um, and what, what uh, you need to do and what is going to expect it from you on, the other, on, 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 on your side. Just to recap is, is that basically um, we want to make sure that we try and reduce that fierce uh, tension uh, pain cycle. And the way, best way to do this is by doing a education, by attending um, antenatal classes, by speaking to people about the experience, which can be a good and a bad thing. Um, but to make sure that you try and understand what's happening so that you can break that cycle, so that your experience of labor, whether you choose to have a normal delivery or a cesarean section, whether you choose to have a more natural birth versus a more uh, birth with epidural, it does not matter. Your experience should be what you and your husband wants. Um, and it's a, um, it's a priority for us to make sure that we do it in a safe way and that we provide you with what you need. Uh, 
because we and because I believe and my team here believe in making sure that people are educated, making sure that people understand what's going on with them, making sure that people are informed and empowered to make choices and understand the risk and the benefits of things. Um, we've created this uh, program as the If Your Age Life Parenting Program. It is uh, all about educating our parents um, and not just our parents for fucking university hospital, but anybody that is pregnant and wants them information. Um, we have four classes that stretch out over four weeks. Every month, this, all these classes are repeated. And we discuss all of the, some of the top, most of the topics that we've discussed today, but we also discuss a lot about birth, uh, what to expect, how it works. We talk about breastfeeding in the second week um, from different positions, why, how you should feed, um, what happens to your body. Uh, we talk about beyond, meaning everything that happens after the delivery, um, immediately in the hospital, um, in the first six weeks with mom, baby, and with dad. Don't forget that. And week four, we talk about safety at home and how to make sure that when you take your baby from the hospital, baby is safe at home. Uh, and uh, anybody can attend these classes. Normally, is we, we advise people to come from 28 weeks onwards, but you can come at any stage. And if you're wanting to come and join us, feel free. You can book on uh, the email that is there on your screen, if you age live at fucky.k, and we will send you all the information that you Thank you very much for allowing me to present this. Um, I hope I've answered some of your questions. And if you have any other questions for me, please let me know. Thank you so much, Jana. It was a really nice presentation. Um, anyone has any questions for Jana? Still have nothing until now. If there's any questions, please type it for us. Okay. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, let's move to the second, to third topic. Um, we want to talk about stem cell storage by Cells of Arabia. I would like to welcome Dr. Shuru, um, a medical representative uh, in CellSafe, and she will make sure to mention for everyone why should you st uh, like save stem cells uh, for your baby. Welcome, Dr. Shuru. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Dr. Ghassan. Thank you, Rana. Um, my name is Shuruk, and as we will continue, all the topics uh, that uh, the pregnant woman has to be aware of, uh, we will continue with the stem cells now. Let me uh, share my screen. One minute. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I'm going to educate you about the stem cells and why you should be aware of it. Um, is it working? Okay. Let's start with why it's important to consider stem cells. Stem cells are our body building blocks, or our body is con uh, contains or built from stem cells, which is differentiated stem cells like skin, nerve, bones. But we will, what we are talking about is uh, the stem cells that comes from the umbilical cord or placenta. Uh, these stem cells, it's un un undifferentiated cells, which can, they have the ability to regenerate and to differentiate into other cells, any body cells, and they can repair the, uh, the damage in our body. That's why until today, Well, that's why until today they can treat more than 80 disease. Most of them so far is blood related disease, such as thalassemia, leukemia, uh, sickle cells, anemia. Uh, the cord blood is found in the vein in the, of, of the umbilical cord, which is considered as a medical vein. 
it can be collected only in the time of delivery and it's rich source of stem cells. These cells are young and naive, which makes them more powerful uh, than mature stem cells. As I said before, they can treat more than 80 disease until today, but excitingly, the clinical trials are underway. There is more than 4,000 disease under clinical trial, and some of them shows a good results. We hope in the coming year, they will be considered as a curable disease, such as diabetic, cerebral palsy, autism, and um, Alzheimer, hair loss, and a lot of more diseases. And as we notice, life is changing and we keep hearing of new diseases. That's why it's more important now than ever to be aware of stem cells. So when you decide to, as a parent, to store your baby stem cells, you give your family members a hope for future. And it doesn't need to be perfect match transplant. As for the sibling, 25% is enough for making transplant. And for the parents, 50% match also enough for making transplant. And this goes only for the cord blood. There are other sources of stem cells that can be benefit your family as well and have more treatment possibilities such as placenta, cord blood, cord vessels, um, and cord tissue and amniotic membrane. Stem Safe Arabia gives you the opportunity to store these precious cells in our state of art uh, laboratory, which is located in Dubai Healthcare City. It means your sample will be processed and stored within three to four hours from delivery time, and that increases the viability of, some of the sample. After processing and storage, the sample, you can choose uh, where do you prefer to store your sample. We have many options, local and international storage. You can uh, choose two locations from UAE, USA, Netherlands, and Switzerland. Also, we offer free transportation to any location of the world should you need your uh, sample for transplant. Um, I will share the video. I don't know if you can hear the voice. Uh, no. No voice. Okay. It's very low. It's very low. Right, as usual. Um, I will share the story uh, in my own words. Yeah. Uh, when, I joined, when I joined Still Save, uh, I heard a story about a boy. His name is Zayed Al-Hamadi. Uh, Zayed, he had uh, he suffered from thalassemia major for all his life, from six months until six years. He needed uh, blood transfusion every two weeks, every other week. And actually, he was suffering, and his family also was suffering from it. Uh, until his uh, mom was pregnant with the other baby, and one of my colleagues, he met her in the hospital and talked to her about stem cells. And unfortunately, the mom, she didn't have a clue about stem cells. And she didn't know that she can save her other child's life with these cells. Uh, we educate her, they store with us. And they, luckily, the, the siblings were fully matched. And they took the sample for uh, John Hopkins Hospital. He made the treatment there on 2011. And subhanAllah, until today, he didn't need any blood transfusion anymore. And he doesn't suffer from thalassemia. So this story makes me and makes us insensitive. We feel this is our job to educate all pregnant about stem cells and to know you're right about this. You can make the right uh, decision for your uh, family. Nobody can force you. But at least for the awareness and education, this is your right. And that's what we are doing. We make uh, education all over UAE to guarantee that all the moms they know about stem cells. If you are interested uh, about stem cells, you want to know more. Uh, I want you to know that it's very easy process and it's not invasive. It will not affect your delivery. It will not affect the baby or your health. This is our collection kit. And once you decide to, to store your sample, before delivery, of course, you have to take the, the decision. 
and you can order your kit. It will come to your doorstep. You can pack it with your doggy bag and take it with you to the hospital on the time of the delivery. Just give it to the healthcare professional, and they will they will know how to collect the sample. You can call our number on the kit anytime. We are working 24 hours to pick up your sample and take it to our lab in um, healthcare city. And after we receive your sample, um, we will uh, quality test process and store your sample. Uh, and it will be ready uh, and available if ever you need it. If you decide to store during this class or through this class, you have offered 3,000 discount. Just use our code and you will get 3,000 discount in free packaging. This is our numbers and I will share on the chat informed content. You can fill the content if you want one of our uh, medical advisors to call you and give you more uh, more education or more information about uh, our uh, back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shurouk. We have a question for you. Uh, is delayed cold clamping a better alternative than stem cell storage? No, it can go together. It will not affect each other. We can still make delayed cord clamping and we can collect the sample, but it will not be alternative. Uh, it's not the same. Okay. Um, any questions, anyone? Um, there is a question, what is the total cost? Oh, we have a lot of packages and it, uh, it can uh, be fit for anybody. We have a range of uh, prices goes from 10,000 to 22,000. It depends uh, what you want to store, where do you want to store it, how many years. But uh, I, may, I, I assure you that it can fit anybody. Just call us and you will get all information. All right. Thank you, Shuru. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we will move to the exciting uh, session. Uh, we would like to welcome Ellie. Uh, founder of the Omoms Club, a qualified yoga teacher specializing in pre and postnatal, a women's yoga, also a qualified hypnobirthing instructor. Um, welcome, Ellie. Shuruk, please uh, remove the, the screening. Okay. Ali, you can start now. One second. Hi everybody, my name's Ellie. I um, hope you all can hear me. I can't actually hear anything, so I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, my name's Ellie and I am a prenatal yoga teacher. Um, I specialize in all things women, um, pre and postnatal, and um, teach classes here in Dubai with the On Mums Club. So today I'm going to go through a little bit about prenatal yoga with you, the benefits and what you can do in pregnancy to help yourself um, stay fit, flexible and prepare yourself for labor. With prenatal yoga, we work in a very different way to, dare I say, regular, regular yoga. Um, and we entirely look at strengthening your uterine muscles, we look at building strength and stamina ready for labor 
Um, so these are the things we really focus on. And then we look at the areas where you may have any um, any common ailments, for example, backache, or we get sort of sore calf muscles. So we really do focus on these areas. I also work uh, with the breathing techniques, and this is for pregnancy to keep you calm and relaxed all throughout your pregnancy to make it more enjoyable. As some days we have very busy minds and our mind takes over. Um, so we breathe to relax and to calm. I'm also going to go through some breathing exercises with you for childbirth itself. And you can practice these breathing techniques every single day in preparation. So hopefully you've got some comfy clothes on. Um, don't worry if you've got a yoga mat or not, you can just do it directly on the ground or pop a blanket or a towel down, as long as you are comfortable. And we're going to start seated in a pose that we call Sukhasana. So this is Sukhasana, easy pose, where we gently cross the legs. Now, if you are experiencing any pelvic pain in your pregnancy, please don't do this as you're really opening into the hips and we're not helping align them. So the best thing to do is take the legs out in front of you and just push the feet away from you. So we're going to start seated and we're going to just take a few breaths here, natural breaths. Now your natural breath flows in through the nose and out through the mouth. We do this every single day. We breathe in through the nose, we breathe out through the mouth. I'd like you to find your natural rhythm of breath. Now, as you breathe, I'd like you to take your shoulders up to the ears, just give them a little squeeze together and slide them back down. And we're going to sit really tall. So we're taking that hunch out of the back. We're lengthening through the crown of the head. Anything, a very slight dip of the chin in, just so you can feel the back of the neck. And close your eyes, shut off the outside world. When you're ready, I'd like you to close your lips, close them entirely. But the exhale now is going to escape around the back of the throat and it's going to come out through the nostrils. So soon you're going to be breathing both in and out through the nose. In through the nose, we feel the turn of the breath at the back of the throat, and we breathe out through the nose. And this is a yogic style of breathing. This style of breathing keeps you calm, relaxed, and focused. It's a lovely breath to do every day. Wake up in the morning, breathe in this way. And again, last thing at night before you go to sleep. If you practice this breath every day, You'll become so comfortable with it. You may have noticed already your exhale starting to lengthen. And as your exhale lengthens, we're producing oxytocin. So this is a lovely breath for the onset of labor, the early stages to help promote our surges. So if you breathe in this way every day, we'll feel very natural to breathe in this way during childbirth. Now I'd like you to take an exhale, release it all the way out. And then I'm going to ask you to take a nice big yawn. Open up your mouth, your jaw, your throat. It's a big wide yawn. Breathe in through your nose and then breathe away from gently parted lips. The gap is so fine, it's almost invisible. So we're now taking the exhale back away from our lips, but the lips are very tight. So it's a very small area between the lips. Your exhale is going to take a long time to release. And if your eyes have opened, I'd like you to close them again. And in your mind, start to visualize a piece of golden thread. You can imagine that it's long, it's thin, it's silky, it's shimmering. Each and every exhale, you're going to send this piece of golden thread spinning. Spinning away from your gently parted lips. Watch the thread, allow it to travel. So we're breathing in through the nose and we're breathing away from our gently parted 
you're watching this tiny piece of golden thread as it flutters off on the breeze. See how far you can send it. And what you're now starting to do is connect your mind and your body together. As we visualize, we're lengthening, we're opening. Our body also will open too. So this is a beautiful breath to use through the active surges of childbirth. I'd like you just to take another couple of breaths here. Enjoy these beautiful, long, extended exhales of breath. And then in your own time, bring your breathing back into its natural, unhurried state, where your inhale and exhale are the same length. You may choose to breathe in and out of the nose, or in through the nose and out through the mouth. On your inhale, taking the shoulders up to the ears, and as you exhale, rolling them back round and down. Inhale, rolling the shoulders all the way up. And we exhale them back down. On your inhale, slide the shoulders up as far as you can. Squeeze them in together on the exhale, sliding them away from the ears. And we're going to do this two more times. This is a lovely way to ease out any tension and start to lengthen your upper body. Now drop the shoulders from the ears, sit really, really tall. Imagine a tiny piece of thread taking you from the crown of the head all the way up to the sky. You're going to take your chin down to the chest, just feeling the back of the neck and start to roll the head from side to side. You're taking your chin from shoulder to shoulder, working into the neck. And starting to let go. Now we're going to roll the head all the way round, taking the head back, opening into the throat, rolling the chin back down to the chest, feeling the back of the neck. Do this three times on one side before you switch to the other side. And then take three rolls on the other side. And this is just so you can balance your body out. In yoga, whatever we do to one side of the body, we try to do to the other side. We feel physically balanced. So I'm taking one last roll of my head all the way around. Now, when your chin comes back down to the chest, roll those shoulders back, sit tall, remind yourself of your alignment. Take a nice big inhale, inhale the head up. Open the eyes, sigh out the exhale. Let it all go. Now, ladies, it's time to inhale the arms up to the sky. Reach up through those fingertips. As you exhale, your right hand comes down. We walk the fingertips out and the left arm comes over. Sink into the right elbow and try to slide your left sit bone onto your, onto your mat or the ground that you are on. Have a beautiful big stretch here, opening up that left hand side. And then flow to the other side. Walk the fingertips out, sink into the elbow. Top arm reaches up and over. So we're opening up the body. As you open up your upper body, we're going to do one more time either side. We're creating space. More space for baby, more comfort for mum. One last time, making sure those sit bones stay firmly rooted to your to the mat or the ground you're on. Beautiful big stretch in the upper body. And then this time, as the top arm comes back down, take it behind your buttocks. The other hand rests on the knee closest to it. Take a big inhale, sit tall, and as you exhale, we're exhaling over the shoulder of the hand behind the buttocks. So my right hand is behind, my left hand is on my knee. My gaze is over my right shoulder. An open twist. Bump stays forward, we're just twisting the top half of the upper body. Back into center, roll those shoulders back and down to sit tall. Leave your right hand on your right knee, left hand behind. Big inhale, we grow tall, we open the chest. Exhale, gaze is over the left shoulder. 
So we've really now been working into our upper body, releasing tension. We're going to come back facing forward, a roll of the shoulders. Time to work into the spine. Now we're going to come forward onto all fours. As you come onto all fours, make sure your knees come to hip width, your hands are shoulder width, and your hands are underneath your shoulders. Taking an inhale into your belly, then exhale, rounding through the back, gently gazing in towards your bum. Inhale, releasing down, a very slight dip of the back and a lift of the gaze. So your exhale will round. And your inhale releases down. These are called cat and cow curls. Now the cat is the focus here. We really want to feel that arch of the spine. Feel each and every vertebrae. As you release your bump down away from your back that's arching up, you're starting to create space. And again, more space for baby, more comfort for mom. These can be done every single day of your pregnancy. And also they're lovely to do early labor. Again, it's all about creating space. Let's take two more cat cow curls, feeling each and every vertebrae of your spine. And then when you've taken them, coming back into a flat back. We're going to walk our hands in towards the knees. We're tucking the toes and we're going to uncurl up nice and slowly. As you come up, lift those arms up and overhead, hands to prayer and hands to your heart. Now your hands are coming behind your back. Place your hands together in a prayer hand and then take them in and up the spine. If your hands haven't come here, just grab onto your opposite elbows and roll your shoulders down. Now we're stepping the left foot forward, soft knee, open chest, nice big inhale in. As we exhale, we're folding down. Now the fold is from the hips only. Release your bump down, take your gaze down and give a good stretch all the way down that left leg. Lift your hips up. So come up, bend into the left knee. Inhale yourself back up. Now we step back, we release those hands and just give a little twirl of the wrists before coming straight back in and stepping the right foot forward. Soft knee, open chest, beautiful big inhale. Exhale down. Lift those hips, straighten out that right leg. Gaze is down, relax the neck muscles. Come up, bend into the knee, lift yourself up, step back, release the hands and a twirl of the wrists. Now we're going to come all the way to the top of the mat. To do so, just take one foot in front of each other. Imagine you're walking a tightrope and this is a great way to help align your pelvic area. When you come to the top, take your feet to hip width. Standing with your feet at hip width. We're going to take a step back. So you're going to put the weight into your left foot. Take a step back with your right foot. If you have got any pelvic pain, not too far. Turning the back toes in so the hips face forward and bending into the front knee. Any pelvic pain would be a very small bend in the front knee as your stance is a lot closer together. You haven't got pelvic pain, edge your foot out, sink into that knee, give yourself space. We're going to lift the arms, roll the shoulders back. We're coming into what's called warrior one, a strengthening posture. Slide the weight down the back heel, bend into the front knee, drop your shoulders from the ears, reach up through your fingertips and lift your gaze. Take a nice big inhale in. And exhale out, drop the shoulders down. Now, if you have got any pelvic pain, please stay here in warrior one. Otherwise, we can come into warrior two. Inhale in, grow tall. As we exhale, we open up the body. Back foot opens even more and we sink down. We take the back arm, that's my right arm, comes all the way back. Left arm forward and the gaze is down the left arm. 
elbow to side, top arm reaches over, extended side stretch. Back into warrior two. Now we're going to lift those arms up, bringing the back heel back in, bringing the toes back in, back into warrior one. And then we're going to take our hands all the way to the hips and step in. Just take a couple of shrugs to the shoulders. We're going to do exactly the same on the other side, taking the left leg back. Toes come in, we bend into the front knee, hips face forward. Arms lift, and we come back into warrior one. Sliding the weight down the back leg, that's your left leg, into your heel, bending into your right knee. Work really tall as you inhale, reach up through the fingers, and as you exhale, root yourself down. And we're going to be opening up again into warrior two. And go a little wider in warrior two. If we go too wide, if you've practiced yoga before, you may feel more flexible in pregnancy. But don't go any wider than you would have done before. Always be mindful in pregnancy. We're a lot softer, a lot more flexible. Now we're taking the gaze forward. Warrior two. Elbow to thigh, top bump reaches over. Extended side stretch. A lovely way to open up the body. Back into warrior two. Arms left, heel comes in, toes come back in 45 degrees. Back into warrior one. Hands to hips. And we step all the way in. Now we're going to take a forward fold to your standing tall. You tend to, in pregnancy, arch the back a little and the shoulders come forward to stand nice and tall. Feet are hip width. We're going to inhale the arms up. Exhale, we fold. Hands come down onto the legs or maybe bending the knees if you need to. And we're going to step ourselves back into tabletop. We're going to come back into our cat and cow cow. Taking five cat cows. Energize in the spine. We're going to, when you've taken them, come back into a flat back. Your left leg is going to come back. Ease your heel down, drop your hip down. Stretch out the calf muscle. You may want to stay here or lift the leg. So we're hip height, right arm comes forward. Extended table. Don't forget to breathe here. Hand comes down, knee comes down. Knees are nice and wide. And we rock those hips from side to side. So this is lovely practice for childbirth. During childbirth, you tend to come onto your hands and knees. It's very comforting. We get the hips moving. If you've got a yoga ball, you can lean over your ball to do this. Practice using the ball in pregnancy. You can birth with your ball as well. And we're going to come back into tabletop. Right leg comes back, toe down, toes down, ease the heel back. So you should be getting a really, really good stretch all the way down the back of the leg. Lifting the foot up in hip height, pushing out through the sole of the foot, left arm forward. Reach out through the fingertips, push out through the sole of the foot. And then we take the hand down the knee down, we take our big toes together, we open those knees up and we slide our sit bones back. Now before you come down, just wiggle those sit bones from side to side. Push the mat away from you, get your sit bones back onto the heels, have a lovely stretch. Now from here, you may want to take the head down or cross the arms or pop a cushion underneath and rest your head. Malasana, child's pose. 
Let your breath settle here. You may want to stay here a little longer, especially when you're practicing at home. Whenever you're ready to come up, come back to seated. Roll those shoulders back and down. Roll out the shoulders. And then walk your way back into tabletop. Now from tabletop, we can either stay low. So if you're on your third trimester, you may want to stay on your knees, keeping your hips in line with your knees, coming down onto your arms, your forearms, reaching your fingertips out and taking your forehead down. In your second trimester, coming back into tabletop, tuck your toes, lift up your hips. We're coming all the way up into downward facing dog. Now in down dog, it's a great way to get all of the muscles working. You can walk the dog by pedaling the feet, working into the backs of the legs, giving them a good stretch out. Release your heels down, lift your hips up and a gentle gaze in. If this feels too much, we bend the knees. We release some of the pressure as we bend the knees. Another two breaths here. Release the knees down, back into Balasana, child's pose. Let your breath settle. Now from Balasana, you're going to come up, working your way back into tabletop. I'm going to show you a nice way to really work deep into the shoulders, taking your right hand on your right shoulder, lifting up your right arm to the sky, opening up the upper body. We're going to thread the needle. Your right hand comes underneath. You may want to pop a cushion down or your ear comes onto the ground. Left arm has the option of lifting. Keep the gaze down. So this is called threading the needle. If it feels too much of the arm lifted, Left arm rest down or out in front. Now we're going to unthread the needle. We're going to do exactly the same on the other side. Left hand, left shoulder, left arm extends. We thread the needle. So as you can see, we're opening up the body first before we come down. Taking a couple of breaths here. Keeping your hips in line with your knees. I stretch in the back, the shoulders. Let's unthread the needle. Take a couple of cat cows just to ease off the back. And when you're practicing prenatal yoga, a gentle lift of your pelvic floor. Release with those cat cows and then whichever way you find easiest to come to seated, coming all the way onto your bottom and shrugging those shoulders back and down. So we're back in Sukhasana, easy pose. Shrug of the shoulders, just easing out any tension, any remaining tension. We're going to lift the arms up and overhead, hands to prayer. Now lift your gaze up to your thumbs. And take the prayer hands down, take the gaze down. Time to connect the mind and the body together. Inhale up. And exhale down. When we learn to connect the mind and the body, this is great practice for childbirth. That's what we put into the mind, filters down to the body. So our mind is strong, unhappy. So we'll tell our body to be the same in childbirth. And we're going to take one more nice big inhale all the way up, lift the gaze. Big inhale and exhale, prayer hands come all the way down. We'll roll back of the shoulders and we're going to finish with a short meditation. Uh, meditation is very important in pregnancy to allow your mind to let go. 
So you can stay seated, or if you prefer to lay down. You can lay down. Wherever you are, close the eyes. Just let those eyes rest. Let the face relax. Let go. Find a comfortable breath. That's in through the nose and out through the nose or the mouth. A calming breath. And as you sit or lay here, you know, maybe you're laying on your back because it's still comfortable. Maybe you've rolled straight to your side because that feels more natural for you now. I'd like you to just take a hand or hands to your bump and feel the connection. And I'd like you, as you feel this connection, send your breath deep down into your belly, deep down into your womb. Connect with your baby, your baby that is growing inside of you. And I'd like you to go deep inside and talk to your baby. Let them know what life's like with you and your partner. Let them know you're excited for their arrival. And just know that you can go deep inside and talk to your baby at any time you wish. Take time, relax, be comfortable, close the eyes, connect and go deep inside. You and your baby are growing together and this is such a special time for you. So make your choices wisely. In this time of our life, we look after ourselves, we're looking after our baby too. Any days we have worries and fears, we take that time out, we take a moment to rest, to feed our mind with positivity, to strengthen our body. When our body is strong, our mind is also strong. And to enjoy, enjoy this time, and to look forward to birth fondly, as your birthday is your most important day of your life. So just knowing that we can go deep inside, we can connect with our babies at any time we wish. And making a promise to ourselves to do this each and every day. The bond is already there and it's going to grow and grow over the next coming weeks, months and years as you get to know your bundle of joy more and more each and every day. I hope your mind has started to switch off. Our minds are very busy in pregnancy. I'm just understanding the more relaxed they are, the easier things become. Each and every day, take time out to breathe, do yoga, to relax and to rest. I'd like you to just give a little wiggle of those toes and a wiggle of the fingers, wake them back up. With your laying or seated, taking a stretch, stretch the arms, stretch the legs, stretch in a way that feels good to you. Taking three deep breaths, breathe in through the crown of the head, all the way down through the body and out through the tips of the toes. Do this three times, energize yourself. And then when you're ready, come back to seated. If you're not there already, and roll your shoulders back and down. We shall end our practice by taking our arms up and overhead, hands to prayer, lifting the gaze. Prayer hands to the third eye, the heart, and to bump. Namaste. And I hope you've enjoyed your prenatal yoga practice today. Please keep up with exercise in pregnancy. It's suitable for, um, if you've done yoga before, your first trimester is fine. If you haven't, hold off to your second trimester. There's a lot going on in your first trimester. This is where the most changes happen. These exercises are all good for your second or third trimester, and they can be done two, three times a week if you wish, just to keep yourself moving, keep yourself active. 
that safely. Um, if you've become tired, ease off a little, but just remember yoga does, even if you're tired, makes you feel more alive later, as does meditation. So keeping up a yoga practice throughout pregnancy is super important. Not only does it make you feel good, but also it prepares you for childbirth and prepares you for life as a new mum. So we want to make you fit, and healthy and strong. So if you do have any questions, um, you can always feel free to come and ask me. Um, I've been a prenatal yoga teacher for over six years now, I'm specializing in prenatal. Um, check us out, www.theommomsclub, so that's Om Moms Club um, on Instagram. There's a website. Come and say hi. If you've got any questions, always feel free to ask me. And thank you for coming today. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you so much. It was really nice. So this brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, so we have two winners for two beautiful uh, giveaways. A big hamper from Pigeon Arabia will go to Vibha Modi. Congrats. Uh, and the second prize will be beautiful basket from Sibamet product. And this will be uh, for Rida Paint. Um, so I will be contacting you both uh, privately and uh, we will discuss the giveaway uh, collection. Uh, we have Mom's World uh, voucher uh, discount for everyone attended and that will be sent by email. Thank you so much all for joining today. I hope you enjoyed your webinar and see you soon again. Okay, have a wonderful day.